China's President Xi Jinping has struck a defiant tone at celebrations marking the 100th anniversary of the country's Communist Party. At a major event in Tiananmen Square, she called for the country's reunification with self-rule Taiwan. He also warned that anyone attempting to bully China would, quote, get their heads bashed. Observers see the comments as veiled threats to Western countries that have criticized China for its human rights abuses and crackdown in Hong Kong. Xi's hour-long speech followed a military flyover, cannon salutes, and patriotic songs in honor of the ruling Communist Party. Now, it has been a turbulent century for China under the party. The party started with a secret meeting of 53 people in Shanghai in a house in 1921. It has since been transformed into a colossal instrument of political control with some 92 million members across the country. Now, after decades during which the People's Republic of China was essentially closed to the rest of the world under founding leader Mao Zedong, the once impoverished nation has been transformed into the world's second biggest economy. The party and its current leader, Xi Jinping, appear to be riding high. From opening the world's second largest hydropower plant to launching the highest luxury hotel on Earth to celebrating its triumphs in space, the Chinese Communist Party is turning 100 and it's marking its birthday with a propaganda blitz to highlight its stability and strength and justify its increasingly tight grip on daily life in China. This week's celebrations will highlight China's rise in recent decades and glorify early days of struggle under founding father Mao Zedong. The Communist Party has ruled China for 72 years of its 100-year history. No other dictatorship has been as successful at expanding international influence, adding military muscle and overseeing economic growth. The party will gloss over policies like the Great Leap Forward, in which millions starved, and the Cultural Revolution of half a century ago. And there'll be no mention of the bloody crackdown on pro-democracy protesters at Tiananmen Square in Beijing in 1989. This week, the party will be all about promoting the success of its Marxist-Leninist political system and of boosting Supreme Leader Xi Jinping, who enjoys more power than any leader since Mao. China's brand of state capitalism weathered the global financial crisis while many richer nations floundered. And despite initially mishandling the coronavirus outbreak which started in Wuhan, China's economy is back on course, while most other countries are still barely coming out of lockdown. But while China celebrates, there is growing international unhappiness about China's more aggressive approach on the world stage, about the oppression of Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang and about the dismantling of freedom in Hong Kong. And let's cross over now to correspondent Matthias Bollinger, who is following the celebrations in Beijing. Matthias, I'd just like to begin by asking you, we heard during the ceremonies that President Xi Jinping said China would no longer be bullied. What message is he trying to send the world? Well, the message is first and foremost a message to the Chinese people. The Communist Party uh, uh, defines its, its, its legacy, its legitimacy by uh, what they call having liberated China from foreign powers, from colonial powers. Um, that was, of course, uh, a long time ago, 72 years ago, uh, when Mao Zedong founded the, the People's Republic. Uh, but with communism uh, uh, and, 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 and Marxism being less and less uh, uh, visible and important in China, this nationalist message is the most important that the Communist Party has. Then this never be bullied again is something Xi Jinping has been repeating. That is how he sees his role. He has finally established the strength of China. Uh, after the liberation, China become wealthy under Deng Xiaoping and now Xi Jinping sees himself and, 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 and paints himself as the man who has made China strong again, a strong military that uh, de defends its interests, its perceived interests all over the world. And uh, of course what he means is, uh, uh, refers to all kinds of disputes that China has, South China Sea, Taiwan. And it also refers to criticism from abroad 
uh, the Communist Party is less and less tolerant for those who do not share its worldview. Given uh, that criticism, Matthias, what can the world expect from the Chinese Communist Party in the years ahead? Well, that's always hard to say. Xi Jinping has made it clear that he wants to unite, as he called it, Taiwan with the mainland China. He wants to most likely conquer Taiwan because there are no uh, whatsoever hints that the Taiwanese people might voluntarily join this People's Republic. Um, whether this will happen or not will depend on a lot of things, but the threat has been more and voiced more and more often in the past few years. Matthias, how are people, um, you know, in Hong Kong, in, in Taiwan, for example, likely to view this day? Or, or, or we also have to say, you know, Chinese who have fled abroad? Well, um, in Hong Kong, this day is also a special day. It marks the 24th anniversary since the handover from Britain to China. That was usually the occasion where the Hong Kong people would march for their liberties, for the uh, protest against the grip of the Communist Party. Now, in this past year, the Communist Party has tightened this grip with a new national security law that has been, that has come into effect one year ago exactly. Uh, so for the people of Hong Kong, of course, the mood is very different than from those who attended the ceremony in Beijing at the Tiananmen Square. Matthias Bollinger in Beijing. Thank you. And for more, let's bring in Richard McGregor, senior fellow at the Australian think tank, the Lowy Institute, and he's written extensively about China's Communist Party. Uh, how has the party changed the country over the past 100 years? Well, you know, the party wasn't in power until 1949, and from 1949 until about 1978, you know, the party changed the country a great deal, but it didn't enrich the country. China really only took off after Mao died. And since then, if you've got 1.4 billion people and an economy growing almost every year at about 10%, that's not just going to transform China. That's really going to transform the world. And that's what we're seeing unfold in front of us right now. And, and we're also seeing China, of course, asserting itself more and more on the international stage against that backdrop that you have just mentioned. Xi Jinping, in fact, uh, warning in his speech that foreign forces attempting to bully the nation will, quote, get their heads bashed. What do you make of that tough talk? Well, I guess, first of all, this is for, you know, a domestic audience for domestic consumption. Um, you know, all politics is local. China is no different in that respect. But I think, you know, there's also a message for foreign countries, particularly Western countries, particularly the United States. You know, China still thinks and also all plays up. The, the idea that foreigners want to keep China down, foreigners want to contain China. Uh, Xi Jinping used the, the word today, enslave China. In other words, foreigners want to do to China what they did during the colonial period. And that is really a highly motivating line of reasoning for him to use. And it creates a kind of emotional connection with people in China who can still get very angry and emotional about the past. And we know that, you know, many of the, these foreign powers, watchdogs, for example, they have been putting the spotlight on human rights abuses in China itself, for example, in Xinjiang, also the crackdown on free speech and the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong. Um, all of these have come under intense criticism. In which direction do you see the party heading? Well, very much in its own direction. You, you know, when China was poorer, it took no notice of Western criticism of human rights. Now that it's richer, it's going to take even less notice. And in fact, you know, is all trying out all manner of ways to fight back and put its own story, which, by the way, have been largely unsuccessful in convincing uh, uh, public opinion in Western countries. All of those different um, issues you mentioned, Xinjiang, uh, Hong Kong, um, you know, later on Taiwan, they all have their own dynamic, uh, uh, but I think um, in their own sort of, you know, context, but I don't think that China is minded to change direction on, on any of those issues uh, in the short term. I'd like to ask you just briefly before we go, uh, you know, President Xi Jinping is set to be ruler for life if he wants. I'd like, just like to ask you, 
How did he pull that off? How has he held on to it? And, and what does it say about the state of the Chinese Communist Party and his grip on it right now? Well, it's quite remarkable. He's really overturned, uh, you know, a few decades of, you know, incremental institutionalization of, you know, peaceful transfers of power. He should have been stepping down at the end of next year. Nobody's expecting him to. So it, it tells you both, number one, he's an extremely powerful leader. Number two, he's a very worried leader because he doesn't feel like it's safe for him to step down. Uh, number three, uh, he wants to, he thinks, you know, has a sort of messianic sense of leadership and mission that only he can carry China to the, you know, modern endpoint that he set for it. Richard McGregor joining us from the Lowy Institute. Thank you so much for your insight on this uh, Chinese centenary of the Communist Party. We appreciate it. Thank you. Now, back in 1978, China was an impoverished peasant state. The Communist Party under Deng Xiaoping decided to bring in a rural reform to increase agricultural production and reduce poverty. Later, the Chinese leadership established special economic zones to attract foreign companies and grant state-owned enterprises more freedom. China quickly became the factory of the world. Beijing then gave a massive boost to the construction sector, building roads, bridges, buildings and railways. Today, the economy of the world's most populous country is still growing. Not even the financial crisis or the COVID-19 pandemic could put a stop to that. Well, for more, I'm joined by Fraser Howie. He's an expert on China and the author of the book Red Capitalism. He joins us from Singapore. Good to have you with us. Now, the full title of your book says uh, The Fragile Financial Foundation of China's Extraordinary Rise. Interesting there is the word fragile. What role do you think will China's economy play 10 years from now? Well, look, I think if you're simply looking at the economic numbers, then the Chinese economy is going to be bigger. It's certainly probably going to continue to grow. The headline growth rates will be lower. It will clearly still be a very dominant player on the global economy. But how necessarily creative it will be, how innovative it will be, how much it will be able to reach, or will its companies be able to reach beyond its, sh its shores are still far from certain. I would also say as well that on this day as we celebrate the 100th anniversary, it's very important to remember in China uh, that you simply can't separate economics from politics. The party certainly does not do that. Xi Jinping sees the politics instrumentalist to the economics. And I think it's very important we remember that because we're coming into a much more volatile time, I believe, for China. And keeping those two things together is very important. Now, if you say that uh, Xi Jinping sees the party politics, politics also instrumental for the economy, I mean, the economy has done pretty well. Where does a communist let country like China fare better than uh, democratic economies like Germany or the United States? Well, frankly, it does not. German per capita or US per capita GDP is multiples of what it is in China. China's rise over the past 40 years has brought it to basically average rates of global per capita GDP. We must remember as well that for the first 30 years of Communist Party rule, they largely ran the economy into the ground. There was a reason it was a peasant economy in the late 70s, and that was because of communist policies. It's been the Communist Party getting out of the way and letting Chinese themselves take control of their lives, which has driven this phenomenal growth. But ultimately, China still remains relatively a poor country. So there are problems ahead. Can you name a few? Sure, there's a lot of problems ahead. There's a number of them that obviously there's domestic issues of demographics, that there's an aging population, they have relatively low school attainment rates, their health metrics are relatively poor. But I think the biggest problem they have is that I think it's Xi, Xi Jinping's geopolitical overreach, that the geopolitical situation for China has become a lot worse since he's come to power. Is basically picked to fight with the US and much of the rest of the developed world. And yet China is highly dependent on the goodwill of the, the, the rest of the world and for semiconductors, for oil, for many other commodities to continue its growth. So I don't think the past 40 years are at all a good idea or a good sort of a model to think about the next coming years in China. All right, Fraser Howie there, China expert and the author of the book Red Capitalism. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us.